I am reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 23 to 28. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Bautista, for reading the scripture for us. And thank you to Justin for that uh, beautiful song. Wonderful message in Christ alone. In Christ alone, I put my trust. In Christ alone, I put my confidence. Just like uh, the songwriter who wrote, uh, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Yeah. But so many things of great significance and import happened this week. One thing, of course, is a um, uh, sad note because they have hit close to home. Um, some of you may have heard the passing of uh, Dr. Lagrimas Reyes, mother of um, Lori Reyes, one of our members, Bangloy, wife of um, Dr. Herman Reyes, who was my professor in college. Um, I understand that um, he is not well himself, still in the hospital, also needing our prayers. Another one that passed um, is a friend, a former classmate since high school days, Dr. Arlene Vigilia. And uh, I've been thinking we have lost um, a number of our classmates from high school, all of them th through cancer. Cancer is so terrible a disease. And uh, when things like this happen, we long for the day when there will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death when Jesus Christ comes to take us to that beautiful home. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, other things also happen in the world that are earth-shattering. Um, of course, this year is going to be a very, very important year, significant year, I think, in the religious calendar. This being 2017, the two, no, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. September 1517, if you remember in church history, 
This was the time when Martin Luther nailed down his 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg and formally started the great Protestant Reformation. He started a movement under the Spirit of God which shook the foundations of the Roman Catholic Church. And this year is the 500th year. And a very strange thing has happened, which has developed from last year. We have mentioned this, we have talked about it uh, in passing, because since last year, what has been um, going on was a movement in the Protestant world where they have started to come to meet, to come to terms with the Roman Catholic Church and have a formal union. Instead of celebrating the 500th year with maybe trying to make a recommitment to the cause of the Reformation, what they have done was to come and join hands and stri strike up a union with the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, this was by invitation of the Pope. And um, as early as um, September of last year, they have already started to say that when this time comes in September of this year, they are going to make a declaration. In fact, they have already signed their intent, and they're going to make a declaration that by September 2017, which is the 500th year of the Protestant Reformation, there will be no more Protestant Reformation. And what does that mean? There's just going to be one church under the Pope. The Protestants are giving up in their struggle for you know, the battle cry of the Reformation was the Bible and the Bible alone is the rule of faith and practice. Sola fide, sola scriptura, the Bible alone, faith alone. We are going to be saved by faith alone. But they are now giving that up because they have already signed their intent that there's no more Protestant Reformation. That's done with. That's over. Now, we don't know what that is going to um, lead up to, but Ellen White says something, that when Protestantism extends their hand across the Gulf and join hands with, with the papacy, what is going to happen is that it's going to open the way to the proclamation and the implementation of the Sunday law. And when the Sunday law is decreed, Revelation 12, 17 is going to be fulfilled. Because it says that the dragon was what? Was wroth with a woman. And may, went to make war with a remnant and her seed. With a woman and the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So there is going to be a persecution such as there never was. It's going to be worse than what was ever witnessed in the history of the world. The Middle Ages that has been perpetrated, perpetrated by the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. So that is ahead of us. Now, one other thing also that happened, I'm sure some of you may have taken note of it. Now, it's something that I was trying to uh, see the meaning and significance of because President Donald Trump of the United States decided to pull out of the Paris uh, Accord the Union of Nations that have signed up and committed to the global warming and climate change. Did you, did you take note of that? Okay. Uh, I believe it was last year when President Obama signed and um, committed the United States into this League of Nations that were supporting this global warming and, and climate change in Paris. And there was great celebration. Now, 
those of us who are students of Bible prophecy, of course, know the, the undertones. We know the significance of this because behind this global warming and climate change is the Pope. And if you remember that he wrote an encyclical, I believe that was over 300 pages, an encyclical about global warming and climate change. And he said that the reason for this problem that we are having in a world today, why we are suffering because of global warming and climate change is because of the greed of human beings. They are so hungry and greedy for material benefit. And so they don't care about their environment. They produce whatever they want to produce in this consumer society. And regardless of whatever destruction it will cause, all this industrial production, it will cause the environment. They don't really care because of their greed and their avarice. But then he, he adroitly inserts something. And he says, the way we can solve this problem of global warming is to have a revival of true godliness. We need to go back to God. We need to have the heart changed. And we need to love our neighbors and our fellow men. We need to think about the welfare of other people. And he says that. And then in the end, he says, we need to once again keep holy the sacredness of Sunday, God's rest day. See, that's the Pope talking. And when President Obama signed and committed the United States into this uh, Paris Accord, this, in this League of Nations, we were saying, wow, this is the beginning of the um, implementation of Sunday law, proclamation and implementation of Sunday law. And now, um, Donald Trump has decided to pull out the United States. A very unpopular move. In fact, uh, he has been receiving a lot of flack and was criticized so bitterly by many of these leading nations. But Donald Trump, of course, says, now I want the United States to be on its own. We can take care of the environment. I don't want any of these nations uh, trying to pressure us or dictating to us. Now, we don't know what that really means, but maybe it's giving us a little more time to do whatever work we need to do. Amen? Maybe that's what is going to happen. Maybe we have a little more time that the United States has pulled out of this global warming and climate change accord so that uh, we will be able to do what we need to do in the time that is allowed to us. Okay, um, today the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. What is this about? Is this something that is in the scriptures? You know, one of the unique contributions of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to the world of theology is the doctrine of the sanctuary. And we're happy about that. And we are proud to admit that. And we want to thank the Lord for giving us his light, of course, through his messenger, Ellen White, and through the pioneers of old that spent hours and hours, days and weeks in fasting and prayer and Bible study. And we came to an understanding as a group of this doctrine of the heavenly sanctuary. Why is there a need of cleansing in heaven, in a place where there should be purity, and pristine uh, holiness, why would there be a need for cleansing? To answer this question, we need to go back to um, Hebrews. Okay, it was read to us earlier today, but the first part of the passage that we read, there is a need of cleansing for both, meaning the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary. Because here it says, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be, what? Purified with these. 
but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So what the writer to the Hebrews, Paul, is saying is that it was necessary that the earthly sanctuary should be purified, okay, with these sacrifices, the blood of goats and other animals. But then he says, the heavenly sanctuary needs to be purified also, except that it needs to be purified by better sacrifices. And that better sacrifice that will need to purify the heavenly sanctuary is the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so what we need to do is to go back to the earthly sanctuary and see what happened in there. If you remember in the start of the series, we talked about the earthly sanctuary and its services. These were God's primer. It was what God has given to us so that we could understand his plan on how he could ultimately do away with sin. So in the earthly sanctuary, there were two kinds of services. First was the daily service. And this daily service, this was held at a courtyard of the tabernacle and also in the holy place. So these two places, in the courtyard and the holy place, this was where the daily service was held. And it was performed by whom? By the priest, the regular priest. Okay. What did it include? It included the morning and evening burnt offering. See, if you try to picture in your mind um, the physical site, in the courtyard there was this altar of burnt offering and there was this labor. And morning and evening, an animal was sacrificed on the altar of burnt offering. This was part of the daily service. And then this also included the priest going into the holy place of the sanctuary, lighting the seven candlesticks. And then he also ate the bread on a table of showbread. And then he burned incense. Now, all of this, of course, represent Jesus. These are all shadows that pointed to Jesus because the candlesticks represented Jesus Christ who was the light of the world. And the bread that a priest ate, priests representing the people, but they, he ate of the bread, it represented Jesus Christ who was the bread of life. And as he burned the incense, it represented the ministry of Jesus as mediator and also included with the prayers of the saints or the believers. And then, Finally, we have this, which has to do with our study today, the killing of the sin offerings or those animal sacrifices. And we've come across uh, this earlier. Um, as far as this uh, service was concerned, this happened in the courtyard. This was the altar of burnt offering. So morning and evening, the sacrifice was burned and offered in here. And then, um, anyone who sinned would come, if he repented of that sin and wanted forgiveness, he would bring his offering, and he would have a knife, and he would kill the animal himself. Okay? And with the assistance of the Levites, of course, the priest would be officiating. And then, he would go into the holy place and he would do a number of things as far as the blood of the sin offering was concerned. He would take the blood of the sin offering and sprinkle that on the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. He sprinkled it on the veil that was before the mercy seat that contained the law of God that was violated. I think, um, okay, so when the sin offerings were killed, this was what happened. The priest would sprinkle the blood before the veil. And then what else did he do? He put the blood on the horns of the altar of incense. 
The altar of incense was also in the holy place, and he would dip his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar of incense. Or one other thing that he did with certain offerings, certain sin offerings, he would eat the flesh of the sin offering in the holy place. Okay? That's the reason why some priests then became very fat, because they were eating a lot of uh, uh, meat. Because the more sins that the people confessed, the more offerings and the more meat they would eat. <laughs> and priest Eli was one of those. In fact, he lost his balance while he was sitting. He fell and broke his neck, and he died. Okay. Now, what did this mean? When a priest took the blood of the sin offering and sprinkled it on the veil before the mercy seat that contained the law of God, what did it mean when he put the uh, blood on the horns of the altar of incense? Or when he ate of the flesh of that sin offering? What that meant was it symbolically transferred the sins of the people to the sanctuary. Okay? So the sins of the people who sinned, they would confess that on the sin offering, right? And as the priest did all these things, those, those sins that were confessed were transferred into the sanctuary. In that ritual, the earthly sanctuary was defiled. The holy place became unclean. And so it needed cleansing. It needed cleansing. And that was the reason there was a need for another service. Okay? This other service was the yearly service or the Day of Atonement. And it's called Yom Kippur. Okay? Now, what was this yearly service about? With this yearly service, it was only the high priest that officiated. And he did it in what place? He did it in the most holy place of the sanctuary. And what are some of the things uh, that, we, that we read about as far as this service is concerned? It is called a day of atonement, this yearly service, or sometimes called the cleansing of the sanctuary. So because all these sins were transferred from the people to the animals to the sanctuary, then there was a need to have this everything taken out and the sanctuary be cleansed. It was also a day of judgment, a day of judgment. In fact, when the priest, the high priest would go into the most holy place, we find out that it was possible for this high priest to die when he came in the presence of God. If his sacrifice was not accepted, he could die. And if he died, since nobody was allowed to enter the most holy place, he had a rope tied on his leg so that if he died, then, you know, they would just pull him back out. But people would be there, and it was a holy Sabbath. And all the nation of Israel were standing outside the tabernacle, and they were waiting. And after a while, after the high priest did his ministry in the most holy place, when they heard the tingling of the pomegranate bells that were attached to the hem of his priestly garments, then there was rejoicing in the hearts of the people because they knew that the sacrifice of the high priest for himself and for the people were accepted by God. Okay? That was good news to them. Okay? It was a day of judgment. And it was the holiest day of the year, and no work of any kind was done. Okay? So uh, we find this um, described more specifically in Leviticus chapter 16. Because this involved two goats during the yearly service. And here in verses 7 and 8, 
He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So two goats that were selected that would be brought to the door of the congregation, tabernacle of the congregation. And then lots would be cast. Which one would be the Lord's goat and which one would be the scapegoat or also called Azazel. And then in verses 9 and 10, Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. This goat which, uh, upon which fell the Lord's goat would be killed and the blood would be used to atone for the sacred place, for the most holy place and the holy place. But a goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. It would be let loose into the wilderness. And then he shall take of the blood of the bullock because a bull was going to be killed and the blood was going to be used for an atonement for the sins of the high priest because he is also a human being and he also has his own sins. So he also needs to be atoned for. And it was going to be a bullock that was used, the blood. He will sprinkle it. He would go into, uh, through the veil into the most holy place. And he would sprinkle the blood of the bullock with his finger. How many times? Seven times. Seven times. And then he will kill the goat or the sin offering. This is the Lord's goat now. That's for the people. That is to atone for the sins of the people. And then bring his blood within the veil and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. Sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Again, how many times? Seven times. Seven times. A symbol of completeness and perfection. And then what will he do? He will make an atonement also for the holy place. He will come back out from the most holy place, go to the holy place, and then he would atone for the holy place. Um, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And then here, to complete this service, when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And what is he going to do with the live goat called Azazel or the scapegoat? Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and he will confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all the transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of the men into the wilderness. So it will be like he will have all the sins that were transferred there during the year through the daily service, and he will go out and get to the uh, scapegoat, and he will confess all the sins on the head of the scapegoat, Azazel, and will lead him by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And then it says, the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto a land not what? Not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Okay? So that ended the yearly service. Uh, we see here um, the high priest, what happens is that the high priest makes atonement for himself, and then he also makes atonement for the sins of the people, and then he cleanses the sanctuary of the sins of the people that were transferred there during the daily services during the year. And then the goats that were selected, the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. The blood of the Lord's goat will be sprinkled, as we have read, in the most holy place and also the holy place. So we see here a uh, pictorial uh, portrayal of uh, the two goats now. One is chosen as the Lord's goat, and the other is chosen as the scapegoat or Azazel. 
And then, after the service is done, the high priest goes, and then he confesses all the sins of the people of Israel on the head of the scapegoat. And he would, after that, he would, let, he would let this goat be led by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So this fit man, the most muscular man that they could find in the camp, uh, he would take this goat, bring it out into the wilderness, so far away, the farthest he could take him to, in the hopes that he would never, never, ever make its way back into the camp of Israel. So that's how the sins of the people of Israel were taken away and how the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, was cleansed. Okay. The daily and the yearly in the earthly sanctuary. So what do these mean, these services? We have learned earlier that when Jesus Christ expired on the cross, he said, it is what? It is finished. He cried out, it is finished. And there was convulsions in nature, earthquake and lightning and thunder, and there was darkness. And in the earthly temple at that very time, says Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So the, the veil that was separating the holy place from the most holy place was rent from top to bottom, which means that it was done by God. Because if it was a human being that did it, it would have been rent from the bottom to the top. But it was God who did it. And when that veil was rent in twain, it exposed the most holy place where was the dwelling place of the glory of God, where was the presence of God. So it meant that this was the end of the earthly sanctuary services. And then we see here the priest terrified at all this happening in a most holy place. So now we have who? We have Jesus Christ. We have Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, who is our high priest. And his priesthood is better than the Levitical priesthood, as we have learned, because of he himself is the sacrifice. It says, For Christ is not entered in the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So when he died, after he sacrificed himself, his blood became the sacrifice by which he was going to minister in a heavenly sanctuary. Um, he ascended to heaven to become our high priest, so that now Jesus Christ is our high priest. Okay? Praise the Lord. He is now our high priest. And Ellen White has this to say in gr great controversy. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death and upon the cross. By his death, he began that work which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered. Hebrews 6 verse 20. And so the earthly sanctuary is done and is over with. So now we have to focus our eyes to the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus Christ is ministering and interceding in our behalf in the sanctuary. And Ellen White also says a great controversy that it is the master plan of Satan to try to divert our attention, to detract our attention so that we don't focus our eyes on Jesus, so that we focus our eyes on the things of this earth. And there's a reason why the enemy of all souls started to make uh, this very prominent, this uh, counterfeit uh, priesthood here on this earth. But there's nothing more about that that is needed because we have Jesus Christ interceding for us in the heavenly sanctuary. And so, now, 
if the earthly sanctuary and the services there were simply typical of something, so what must be the reality? If these were shadows, what happened in the earthly sanctuary, and what would be the reality? These are the reality, the antitypical daily service. So after the Levitical priesthood ended and the earthly sanctuary now was no longer uh, functioning, in the antitypical daily service under the priesthood of Jesus Christ, when a sinner accepts Jesus as Savior and Lord, his name is written in the what? In the book of life. So those of us, when we accept Jesus Christ, under the priesthood of Jesus Christ, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, then our names become written in the what? In the book of life. Now, there are a number of books in the Bible as far as the judgment is concerned. First one is the book of life. This is the book upon which your name and my name are written when we profess faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Our names get written in that book of life or when we enter into the service of the Lord, okay? And those that will overcome in Daniel chapter, chapter 12, verse 1. Also Revelation 21. And there's another book. It's called the book of what? The book of remembrance. What is this book about? All those good deeds of God's professed people, they are written in this book, the book of remembrance. We don't have time to read all these texts, but you can take note of this one, Malachi 3.16. It says that those who love the Lord, they talk constantly with one another, and all their good deeds were put in this book of remembrance. And then there's another book. It's called the Book of Record. Now, this book of record is something that is very important because in this book is written all the sins of the people that have professed belief in Jesus Christ. So all of you, all of us that have professed faith in Jesus Christ, when we do something, either in word or even when we speak or even in our thought, any sin that we commit, they are recorded in this book of record. Every secret thing, whether it's good, whether it's evil, um, public or private, secret or known, these are all written in this book of record. Okay? So that's what happens when uh, in this uh, antitypical daily service. Our names get written in the book of life, and then the good deeds are written in the book of remembrance. When we do something good, when we go to Ascension and feed the homeless, <laughs> when uh, we help somebody or some, uh, do other good deeds. Now, when we sin, all our sins, they get recorded faithfully by the angel in that book of records. And then... When we repent of that sin, what happens? The word forgiven is written opposite that sin. Okay? It says forgiven. Opposite every sin that we have committed. Whatever they are, no matter how great or small they are, if we have repented of them and confessed of them and asked for pardon from, from God, then the word forgiven is written opposite that sin that we have committed. Amen? Amen? Yes. That's great news. And now, in the antitypical day of atonement, we talk about the antitypical daily service. What happens is, it is also called the cleansing of the sanctuary or the investigative judgment. It means cleansing because when we commit a sin, that sin is recorded in what? In heaven. And symbolically, that sin is transferred in heaven. So, if the sin is recorded in heaven, then there need to be a what? A cleansing, a removal of the sin. That's why there's a need for the cleansing of the sanctuary 
or it's also called investigative judgment. Now, the sins that are confessed and repented of will be blotted out. So that in this investigative judgment or the cleansing of the sanctuary, when it starts or after it started, all the sins to which are written forgiven, those sins are what? Blotted out. They're blotted out. And that's why we find in Acts 3.19, um, Paul, Peter says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? May be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So the investigative judgment and cleansing is a blotting out of sins. Those sins that have been confessed and repented of during the daily service would be blotted out during this antitypical day of atonement. And so here we see someone who has professed faith in Jesus and is standing before the heavenly tribunal, before God as judge. And we have Jesus as intercessor. And Satan will point out he has sinned. And he must what? He must die because the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. The wages of sin is death. He has sinned. And look at all his sins. Long list. He must die because the wages of sin is death. And Jesus will stand up for us. And he said, Father, he has sinned and he must die. But look at these hands of mine and see the nail prints. I gave my life for him. I died for his sins. Take my death as a substitute for his sin. And so our sins would be blotted out during this time of um, judgment. And then it says it involves all who professed faith in Jesus. So anyone who has expressed faith in Jesus, anyone who has said, I believe in Jesus, my Lord and Savior, they will take part. They'll be included in this investigative judgment. Ellen White says, in the typical service, only those who had come before God with confession and repentance and whose sins through the blood of the sin offering were transferred to the sanctuary had a part in the service of the day of atonement. So only those that believe. So in the great day of final atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. The judgment of the wicked is a distinct and separate work and takes place at a later period. And Peter says, judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? Okay, so uh, those that have believed in Jesus, they will be a part of this investigative judgment. And what else? It began in what year? In 1844. It began in 1844. And how did we arrive at this date? We don't have the time to discuss about the timing, about the timetable on the start of the investigative judgment, but this will be discussed in our final uh, presentation of this series. But it started in 1844, and it began with the, what? With the dead who profess faith in Jesus, and it will end up with the living. Okay, it will end up with the living. Now, we have some hints that when the Sunday law is going to be proclaimed and implemented, that will be a sign when the judgment of the dead will pass to the judgment of the living. Okay? As the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name is mentioned, every case closely investigated. Names are accepted, names are rejected. Wow, how solemn these moments would be when our case comes up before the heavenly tribunal and we stand up for this. And it says, all who have sins unconfessed and unrepented of will be what? 
will be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. So anyone who has sins remaining, when his case will come up in a judgment bar of God, if there are sins that have not been confessed and unrepented of, then the name of that person who may have professed faith in Jesus, who may have been a leader in the church, who may have been you know, someone who has done wonderful things for the Lord, if there are sins unconfessed, the name is going to be blotted out from the book of life. And how tragic that is going to be. Here, she says, great controversy. When any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven, their names will be blotted out of the book of life, and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance. See, all those good deeds, all those kind words, whatever we have done in the service of the Lord, they will all be erased from God's book of remembrance. And our name will be erased from the book of life. The Lord declared to Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And says the prophet Ezekiel, When the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, all his righteousness that he had done shall not be mentioned. Shall not be mentioned. Okay. Sins that have been, not been repented of and forsaken will not be pardoned and blotted out of the books of record, but will stand to witness against the sinner in the day of God. He may have committed his evil deeds in the light of day or in the darkness of night, but they were open and manifest before him with whom we have to do. Angels of God witnessed its sin and registered it in the unerring records. Now, I believe we have a couple more quotes from Great Controversy, and these are very, very important. So let's take note of these ones. At this time, what do we need? We need to experience true sorrow for sin Amen. and genuine repentance. That's what we need. Great controversy again. We are now living in the great day of atonement. In the typical service while the high priest was making the atonement for Israel, all were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. See, it was such a very important service. Everybody was concerned. Everybody was involved. And they were there waiting for the priest to be able to come out of the most holy place and out of the sanctuary, because if he did not, that meant that the sacrifice, the atonement that he sacrificed for himself or the one that he did for the people, for the sins of the people, may not have been accepted by God. And so if he did not make it, then the people themselves, that means that they will also be cut off from the land of the living. That's what it meant. So it was a day of seriousness and solemnity, and they afflicted their souls. They, it was a time to search their hearts thoroughly if there was any sin that remained unconfessed and unrepented of because they didn't want to be cut off or to be killed during that time. In like manner, she says, all who would have their names retained in the book of life do we, have, do we want to have our names retained in the book of life? Yes. yes, we do. If we would like to have our names retained in the book of life, we should now, in the few remaining days of our probation, afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be deep, faithful searching of heart. The light, frivolous spirit indulged by so many professed Christians must be put away. It's not a time for jokes. It's not a time for light-hearted banter or whatever. Not a time for focusing on the secular things of this life. We should keep our eyes focused on Jesus who is standing on our behalf, interceding for us in the 
most holy place in the antitypical Day of Atonement, which is now. Yes. And then, what else? Um, there is, um, I believe, the, let's see, sorry. Okay, that's it. That's what we need. She says, we are now living in the antitypical day of atonement. Right now, Jesus Christ is ministering, interceding for us before the Father. We do not know, it could be soon, when the cases of the dead will move to that of the living. And so, she says, it's not a time to be joking around. It's a time to be serious. It's a time to afflict our souls. If there is any sin that we may have in our hearts, something that we have not repented of, then we are to repent of that sin. We are to confess that sin and ask God's pardon and grace so that when a time of refreshing come in the day of atonement when our case will come up, God will blot out those sins and our names will remain in the Lamb's book of life. I'd like to make a, a special appeal, but there's a song that uh, I, I would like us to listen to and Neville Peter one of our gifted Seventh-day Adventist musicians is here with us he's going to be on the piano and he's going to play and sing for us Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I'll want you forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast down every foe. Now wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, look down from your throne in the sky and help me to make a complete sacrifice I give up myself and whatever I know now wash me and I will be whiter than snow oh whiter than snow yes whiter than snow wash me and i will be whiter than snow oh jesus you see that I patiently wait 
now come and within me a new heart create to those who have sought you you never said no I will be whiter than snow, oh, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than be washed so I can be whiter than snow so I can be clean so I can be pure so I can be blameless hallelujah Jesus I want to be just like you just like you pure like you righteous like you Lord wash me and I will be Whiter than snow. I can consider this. Uh message is a very important message today and uh, I thought I'd like to give everybody an opportunity to respond to this appeal as Ellen White says that we're living in the antitypical day of atonement we never know when a time comes when the judgment of the dead will pass to the judgment of the living we're never certain of our lives Life is so uncertain. And she says very clearly, as we have noted, that any sin that remains unconfessed and unrepented of will stand against us when our case comes up in the great tribunal. And so today, I'd like to make an appeal. But maybe you're struggling over something. Maybe it's um, a cherished sin, something that you are not able to give up. But today, you realize the seriousness and the uncertainty of life and the times that we are living in. And you would like to say, Lord Jesus, I want to confess and repent of all of my sin, whatever it is. Could be a direct violation of the law of God. It could be a lust of the flesh. It could be a lust of the appetite. It could be a materialism, um, a special uh, yearning towards the things of this world. But you want to be perfectly whole. And you want to say, Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. And today I want to repent and confess of my sin. And if this is your desire, I'd like to invite you to come over to, this, to the front and we're going to pray. At this very moment, we live in such very, very serious times. And we need to stand before the sight in the presence of a holy God with sins, every sin confessed. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to offer a special prayer for you. Some of you may be struggling with uh, frivolity, and you have not taken your spiritual relationship with the Lord that seriously. And you want to say, Lord, I want to be serious. I realize 
we live in very momentous times in this earth's history. And I want to be serious in my relationship with you. Lord, help me. Help me to be serious in doing the things that I need to do, in loving you most of all, and showing that love to others. Yes. And it's not going to be very long because prophecy is fast fulfilling. Everything that has been uh, full prophesied you know, that have been fulfilled, put it into place. And we know that pretty soon the great tribulation will come upon us and we need to stand in the strength and power of God. But whatever happens, if we have our lives in the hands of Jesus, we'll be safe. And if we have him as our mediator and our, as our intercessor, he has promised to deliver us. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much because of your love for us. Thank you because even now, Jesus Christ is standing in your presence as our mediator, as our intercessor. And although at times we feel discouraged because the devil is trying to call our attention to all the sins that we may have committed, Lord, we have confessed and repented of them. And even when he points at our weaknesses and that time and time again we fall, thank you because Jesus Christ continues to offer that grace to overcome. And he stands in your presence and he shows the prints of the nails in his hands. He died for us. Thank you, Lord, for this love. And we pray, dear Father, that you help each one of us, that we take uh, this seriously, that we live our lives in close relationship with you, and that by your grace, we'll be able to declare your holiness to all the world and be faithful until that day when Jesus Christ returns to take us all home. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer because we ask in his praises. This video was recorded from Central Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church to help prepare people for the soon return of Jesus Christ. If you would like to visit us and for more information, go to www.centralfilipino.org.